Roman history. Compact and easy to understand. Experience ancient Rome from its birth to its fall, including Roman Empire background knowledge. Written by Roman Grapengator. Narrated by Casey Wayman. What you can expect in this book. Starting from the two iconic dates of 753 BC, according to legend, the founding of Rome, and 476 AD, the deposition of the last Western Roman Emperor, Romulus Augustus, the history of the Roman Empire spans more than 1,200 years. This was not only a long period, but also an eventful one. After all, the inhabitants of the city on the Tiber River conquered an empire that, at its greatest expansion in 116 AD, encompassed most of Europe, as well as parts of North Africa and Asia Minor. It would not be difficult to fill hundreds of pages with names and dates from the history of the Roman Empire, and of course such comprehensive accounts already exist. But don't worry, that's not what awaits you here. This book will give you an entertaining introduction to the history of the Roman Empire. You will find here only the information you need to understand why the 1,200-year development took place as the sources tell us, and because incontrovertible facts are often sparser than one would expect or wish, you will also learn what we don't know any more today and why that is so. Nebulous Beginnings The Kingship The Legends the foundation of the Roman Empire is usually equated with the founding of its center, the city of Rome. According to legend, it took place in 753 BC by the first king, Romulus. Including Romulus, there are said to have been seven kings before the last of them, Tarquinus, called Superbus, meaning the haughty one, which was expelled from the city in 509. Tarquinus, former subjects, are said to have made the decision to never again allow a king to rule. One reason why we have only legends about the beginnings of Rome, but practically no facts, is tradition. The so-called Twelve Table Laws from the 5th century BC are the first written evidence of Rome's history, but they do not contain any historical information because they recorded customary law. The first historiographical texts date from the turn of the 3rd to the 2nd century and the majority of them at all only from the 1st century BC. There is a gap of several hundred years between the foundation of Rome and the lifetime of the authors of these texts. It is practically impossible to save reliable data over such a long period of time. The other reason is that the legends about the foundation of Rome and the kingship are not simply beautiful stories. When they were created, they had on the one hand the purpose of creating a common identity from the past. The parents of Romulus and his twin brother Remus are said to have been the priestess Rhea Silvia and the god of war Mars. Rhea Silvia is said to be the daughter of the king of Alba Longa, who in turn is said to have been a descendant of Aeneas, who fled from burning Troy. Here, a direct descent line from Troy to Rome was constructed, which is significant because Troy had the same prestige in the eyes of the Romans as Rome later had in the eyes of its neighbors and in the eyes of posterity. The descent from Mars in turn emphasized once again that Rome was blessed by the gods. On the other hand, the authors of later years took their own present as a starting point to imagine what the early times must have been like in order to lead to the conditions they knew. In this way, the legends reveal something about the ideals of later times, and this is interesting for understanding political culture. The Facts But what can be said about the early Roman period despite all the uncertainties? Archaeological findings show that at the end of the 6th century BC in the area of the Forum Romanum, in the heart of the city, there was already a coherent settlement, but it still had a village character. It is clearly younger than the legendary date of its foundation, although the smaller settlements from which it emerged may have existed much earlier. The names of possibly all seven legendary kings could be later inventions, and also the date of the expulsion of the last king is to be taken with caution. That there were kings in Rome, however, may be regarded as true, 
On the one hand, this is supported by the fact that a phase of kingship across cultures and regions is to be regarded as a normal case of state development. On the other hand, the cults of the gods and the priesthood of the Romans reveal echoes of an older state organization, which were retained even though they increased seemed to have fallen out of time. This kingship should not yet be imagined as a monarch at the head of the city who clearly stood apart from his subjects and was not accountable to anyone for his actions. Admittedly, he combined all the important functions in his person, he acted as the chief priest as well as the chief judge, and held the supreme command in case of war. Apart from that, he was not very different from his subjects. His majesty did not come from the fact that he was special as a person, but that he led the enormously important cult of the gods. It is quite possible that the last king had to leave because he tried to portray himself as exceptional, for instance through a particularly close connection to a deity. There is also widespread agreement that the last king was descended from an Etruscan dynasty. The Etruscans, who lived in Campania, who initially, along with Greek colonists, the most highly developed culture on the Eponine Peninsula. The Romans owed many achievements to them. For example, the so-called Latin alphabet that we all still use today is a variant of the Western Greek alphabet that the Romans learned through Etruscan meditation. The revolt against royal rule could also have been a revolt against a perceived foreign domination. It is not clear, however, whether native Latin rulers had ruled Rome before an Etruscan king or kings, and whether Rome was an Etruscan or a Latin foundation. The Republic The Emergence of the Republican Administration The phase between the end of kingship and the establishment of imperial rule in the form of the Principate is known in German as the Roman Republic. This is the translation of Latin res publica, which simply means public affair. For the Romans, matter was public if it affected all people. By politics, therefore, they understood the regulation of issues that affected everyone, and in the form of the People's Assembly, relatively many men could indeed participate. After the expulsion of the last king, his functions were distributed among several officials. Little is known about the early days of the republican system, only from the 4th century onward does the overall picture become clear. However, the office career probably did not exist from the beginning in the form known later. The Senate probably came into being first. Originally, it was the assembly of the land-owning families, later all men got a lifelong seat in it who had once held a public office. This concentration of all the administrative experience available at a given time fed the authority of the Senate, which was so great that the People's Assembly voted against its decisions only in exceptional cases. The People's Assembly emerged in the 5th century from an older army assembly and broke up into several sub-organizations. The entire People's Assembly elected officials, magistrates, passed laws, and decided on war or peace. All adult male citizens were allowed to elect magistrates and run for election themselves. However, since those eligible to vote had to be present in Rome to exercise their right to vote, only a small proportion of citizens actually participated in political life. As far as passive suffrage was concerned, the electoral system was designed in such a way that wealthy citizens had better chances of becoming magistrates. All magistrates were initially only loosely grouped around the Senate and did not yet have fixed duties. The classical career of office, Latin cursus honorum, probably did not emerge until the 3rd and 2nd centuries BC. In 367, the consulship, the highest office emerged in its familiar form. The comprehensive powers of the consuls, called potestas in the civil sphere, imperium in the military, however, developed only later. In the Roman Republic, those families from which at least one consul had emerged counted as nobility, Latin nobilitas. The other public offices were those of adiable quaestor and praetor. The aediles were, in short, responsible for maintaining public order, the quaestors for the treasury and the praetors for the administration of justice. The offices built on each other. Whoever wanted to become a quaestor had to have already been an aedile. Whoever wanted to become a praetor had to have been a quaestor, and so on.
These three offices in the consulate were filled twice, principal of collegiality, and always awarded for only one year, principal of annuity, in order to create a mechanism for mutual control on the one hand and to avoid a king-like concentration of power on the other. While the number of consuls remained consistently at two since 367, the number of other magistrates was repeatedly increased. Moreover, in addition to the actual magistrates, an individual could be granted the authority of a praetor, protatorship, or a consul, proconsulate, for special tasks. The Battles of the Estates A direct consequence of the end of royal rule were the so-called estate struggles between patricians and plebeians. The patricians were probably the descendants of influential families who had already sat at the levers of power under the kings. In early times, plebeians were all Romans who were neither patricians nor in a client relationship with a patrician. Later, plebeians simply meant non-patricians. This group was very large and socially heterogeneous. It by no means included only have-nots, as our modern usage of the word would suggest. At the time of the king's rule, the king himself had represented the interests of the plebeians. With the end of the king's rule, they lost their advocate, but the patricians did not grant them any other representation. Over the course of several centuries, the plebeians succeeded in gaining political representation and a political voice, such as equality with the patricians. Their success can be explained not least by the fact that the Republic could not do without them. In case of war, the patricians provided the cavalry, the plebeians the infantry. Only the cavalry would never have been enough to stand up to an opponent, so the patricians had to be happy if the plebeians continued to take up arms and ultimately could not close themselves off to their demands in the long run. The first success of the plebs was the creation of the office of tribune of the people, traditionally dated to 495. The tribunes were to represent the interests of the plebs in the people's assembly and the senate. To this end, the plebs made them untouchable, sacrosanct, meaning that whoever attempted to physically harm a tribune of the people could expect to be killed by plebs. The people's tribunes achieved the full extent of their powers with the veto power. Now they only had to say, veto, I object, to stop a decision in the Senate or People's Assembly. As of the other magistrates, there were probably originally two tribunes of the people whose number was gradually increased. The office of the tribune of the people was not integrated into the career of office, but it offered a good starting point to successfully enter it. In 367, the plebeians managed to be admitted to all offices. From that year on, there were two consuls, because henceforth one patrician and one plebeian were to be elected to the highest office. In 287, the Hortensian Law was passed, by which the decisions of the assembly of plebeians became binding on the entire popular assembly. By the middle of the 3rd century, the division between patricians and plebeians had been resolved. The tensions that had previously simmered for decades and centuries had repeatedly become so great that they put the Republic to the test. The fact that the Republic not only survived this period unscathed, but even emerged from it stronger, was probably largely due to the parallel expansion. As long as there were external opponents who had to be defeated, there was a goal on which patricians and plebeians could agree and with which they could identify, regardless of all tensions. Also, the spoils of war benefited everyone equally because both groups provided part of the army. The Roman Expansion During the reign of the king and in the early days of the Republic, the Romans ruled a comparatively small area surrounding the city. In the 5th century, they may still have waged war primarily to defend themselves against their neighbors, who were normally more powerful and larger. Since they were successful in this, they were soon able to make territorial gains, which in turn increased their military clout. In newly acquired territories, the Romans established colonies that had to provide for their own defense. They concluded alliances with their subjugated neighbors, obliging them to provide troops in the event of war. Both were the prerequisite for Rome to start waging wars not out of political necessity, but out of a desire for power. The exact date of this turning point is disputed but it could have occurred as early as the 4th century. Then, in the 3rd century, the expansion accelerated enormously. In the first half of the century, Rome finally gained 
hegemony over the Apennine Peninsula. It thus became a serious power in the western Mediterranean, which put Carthage, a city-state centered in what is now Tanzania, on the map. Previously, the two cities had certainly cooperated, but in 264, their relations turned to confrontation. That year, Rome used a pretext to attack Sicily, its only remaining serious rival in the Apennine Peninsula. Sicily was allied with Carthage, so this maneuver triggered the First Punic War, 264 to 241. Carthage suffered a bitter defeat, but was not completely defeated. In the following years, the city-state recovered and was able to establish a new base at the Iberian Peninsula, which was a thorn in the side of the Romans. The commander, Hannibal, preempted a Roman attack in 218 with his famous move across the Alps, triggering the Second Punic War, 218 to 201, which, regardless of initial success, sealed Carthage's end. The Romans next turned their attention to the eastern Mediterranean, where King Philip V of Macedonia, a former ally of Carthage, ruled. He was finally defeated in 196. Greece did not come directly under Roman scrutiny thereafter, but Rome became the guarantor power for its internal order. In the course of their expansions, the Romans proceeded to establish provinces instead of binding new confederates to themselves. In 227, the first provinces to emerge were Sicily, Sardinia, and Corsica. Unlike the confederates, they did not provide auxiliary troops, but paid money to the center. The reason for this change could have been that naval warfare, which was important from the First Punic War onward, was more costly than purely land warfare, and at the same time the Confederate system already provided sufficient soldiers. Thus, within three generations all the empires bordering the Mediterranean came under Roman scrutiny. This was an enormous expansion that encompassed much of the civilized world known at the time. It not only changed the balance of power around the Mediterranean, but also had an impact on the internal constitution of the Roman Empire. Consequences of Expansion The almost constant wars transformed the Roman Republic into a warrior society with a corresponding mentality. It became a typical Roman trait to give up in a war only when the defeat could no longer be shaken, which required a determined will to persevere. Furthermore, individual prestige was linked to military success. Those who distinguished themselves militarily were publicly honored. Throughout Rome, for example, numerous monuments to generals were erected. Such notoriety, in turn, acted as a springboard for a political career, and this close intertwining of military glory and political success had several consequences. Since military success was the surest way to gain prestige, the ruling class had an interest in creating ever new opportunities for someone to excel such as to ensure that Rome was almost constantly at war somewhere. Under this condition, a cautious, peacekeeping foreign policy was just as undesirable as the early termination of a difficult conflict that might still be winnable. However, as all commanders rushed into office, competition for the few magistrates was fierce. Attempts to reduce the number of potential candidates through additional regulations, such as the minimum age for each office, helped somewhat, but did not solve the basic problem. It is well known from the economy that scarce but sought-after goods become more expensive, and so it was with Roman offices, although more expensive here is by all means not only to be understood figuratively, but also literally. After it was forbidden to pay voters directly to elect a particular candidate, candidates spent their money on measures to increase their popularity. As everyone did this, larger and larger sums became necessary to achieve this effect. From the 2nd century BC at the latest, anyone who aspired to a political career needed an increasingly large fortune in the background to have any chance at all. For many families from the patrician and knightly classes, the financial cushion took the form of landed property. They acquired land with their share of the spoils of campaigns so that their sons could later run for a political office. Land did not necessarily bring the highest income, but it was still the most popular financial investment because it provided the right image. A wealthy Roman had to be a landowner to be considered anything. As expected, the more land came into the possession of the wealthy, the less irritable land remained for small farmers. They were unable to pay fancy prices to secure the land they needed for their livelihood. Their situation was aggravated by the fact that Rome hardly established any new colonies on the Apennine Peninsula from the early 2nd century onward, 
This meant that it was no longer possible for properly less peasant sons to build up an existence in a colony with their own farm after completing their military service. The increasingly scarce land was thus to provide for more and more people. The problem of the rural population was one of the greatest in the late Republican contemporaries were aware of it. There were repeated proposals for redistributing the land in order to halt the impoverishment of broad sectors of the population, but the Senate rejected all advances. The senators acted on the principle that less land for themselves meant falling behind in the political competition, and they could not or would not allow that. At issue, however, was not only the livelihood of the peasants, but also the provisioning of the dispossessed veterans whose numbers increased sharply at the turn of the second to the first century. Initially, only legionnaires who owned a farm themselves had served in the army, but this principle became more and more frequent and increasingly diluted until a relevant proportion of legionnaires were dispossessed. In this situation, it became common for each commander to take care of the provisioning of his legionnaires himself. Thus, a close bond already developed between a commander and the actively serving men because the latter knew very well that it depended on their commander under which material circumstances they would spend their old age. Together with a second development, this bond helped make the military a decisive political power factor. During campaigns, it was repeatedly necessary to extend a magistrate's tenure beyond one year so that he could compete the task at hand. Sometimes this turned into a tenure lasting several years so that field commanders could develop the feeling that they were not only administering an official power, not only being assigned to a specific task, but actually holding the office. Accordingly, their willingness to accept the end of a magistrate or a commission could decline, and all the more so if they knew their soldiers were loyal behind them. This became crucial to the clustered crisis of the late Republic. The Late Republic The year 133 BC is considered the beginning of the Late Republic because that was when it first became apparent what later intensified and became characteristic of this phase. More and more actors disregarded the customs of the political establishment or found loopholes to circumvent them. At the same time, they used new, violent means to end political conflicts. The prelude was the work of Tiberius Sapronius, Gracchus, the younger, who was 133, one of the tributes of the people. He presented a plan to the Senate on how to redistribute the land in order to stop the pauperization of the peasants. Gracchus's plan was by no means radical, but the senators rejected it for fear of losing wealth. They got another tribune of the people, Marcus Octavius, to veto it in the People's Assembly so that the plan could not pass. So far, so ordinary. What was completely unheard of, however, was that Gracchus went on the counterattack. He got the People's Assembly to dismiss Octavius for violating his duties so that his land reform could now be passed. In this way, he had outmaneuvered the Senate, and he did not hesitate to do so again. The land reform had been passed, but money was needed to carry it out, and only the Senate could release it. The senators, however, did not think of it, so Gracchus seized the opportunity when a tidy inheritance of the Asia Minor city, a Pergamum, was to fall to the city of Rome. He declared that Rome would accept the inheritance and use the money for land reform. In other words, he made a foreign policy decision that was normally reserved for the Senate. To cap it all, Gracchus announced that he would run for tribune of the people again in the following year, 132. In this way, he wanted to ensure that his reforms were not immediately reversed. Until then, it had never happened that someone ran for the same office two years in a row. Not only that, but Gracchus had the best chance of actually making it to re-election because he tied his supporters to him by the issues he stood for. This, too, was an innovation in Rome's political establishment. Traditionally, candidates in the Roman Republic were elected because of their name, because they themselves had acquired military prestige, because they came from a distinguished family, or because, ideally, both applied to them. In his first election, Gracchus had been no exception. His father of the same name had twice been consul and had negotiated an important peace with the Celtiberians in 179 to 178, without which the Iberian Peninsula could not have been pacified. However, Gracchus's chances of being re-elected were primarily due to the fact that he demonstratively represented the concerns of the common people. Gracchus's renewed candidacy was the provocation that the Senate would no longer tolerate. 
Several senators stormed a popular assembly he was holding and killed him and several of his supporters with brute force. This was the first murder in the history of Rome that was committed to get rid of an unpleasant political competitor. It was not to be the last. The same fate befell Tiberius Gracchus's younger brother, among others. Gaius Gracchus felt committed to his brother's program. He too relied on passing resolutions, bypassing the Senate, for example, by relying on the knighthood, which until then had played no role politically, and he also introduced a proposal for land reform that the Senate rejected. Moreover, when the establishment of colonies in North Africa pursued by Gracchus was terminated in favor of the veterans, he withdrew with supporters to the Aventine, one of the seven hills of Rome, ready for confrontation. Now the senators invented the Senatum Consultum Ultimum, English last decision of the senators, as the final verdict in a matter and on this newly created legal basis sent one of the consuls with troops to the Aventine. Gracchus was killed in the ensuing battles. The following years were by no means quiet, for the next major crisis did not befall the Republic until several decades after the Gracchi. In 88, the consul Lucius Cornelius Sulla was sent east with troops to fight Mithradis VI of Pontius, who threatened Roman interest in the eastern Mediterranean. Sulla was at this time carrying on a conflict with the tribune of the people, Publius Supplicus Rufus, by the Julian Law, Lex Julia, passed in 90. All Confederates in the Italic heartland had been granted citizenship and thus the right to vote in the popular assembly. Still open was the question of how the new voters were to be incorporated into the 35 tribus, thus territorial units of the city of Rome from which the People's Assembly was drawn. Rufus wanted to divide them equally among all tributes because this would have given the People's Assembly the greatest increase in power. Sulla, on the other hand, was one of those senators who wanted to give the Senate more weight again and advocated adding new voters to only a few tributes. Sulla tried to prevent the vote in this regard. Rufus reacted by depriving him of the command against Mithrades and giving it to Gaius Marius, who agreed with him and had distinguished himself in the wars against Cimbri and Teuton at the turn of the century. Rufus's actions were questionable, to say the least, but even more questionable was Sulla's reaction. Having assured himself of the support of his soldiers already in the place of his command, he simply ignored the deposition. Over the next few years, he fought Mithrades VI on his own and even made his own peace with him, while in parallel, Marius fought Mithrades on behalf of the Senate and also made a peace. Here, for the first time, the military served a general as an individual power base, an individual mass of disposal, but it did not stop there. After making peace with Mithrades, Sulla invaded Italy with his troops in 83. The following year, they conquered Rome. At that time, it was a unique event that a Roman military captured the capital with his own troops to prevail against other Romans. As a result, Sulla became dictator. Dictatorship was an ancient institution. In threatening situations, the Senate could give unlimited command to an individual to resolve the emergency. The dictatorship ended either after a precisely defined period of time or when the reason for its establishment objectively no longer existed, because, for example, a war with heavy losses ended victoriously after all. Sulla, on the other hand, was to decide for himself how long his dictatorship would last, so he could theoretically have extended it indefinitely. To everyone's surprise, however, he withdrew completely from politics as early as 80, having carried out several reforms designed to restore the Senate to its former importance. Sulla did not leave without reassurance, however. During his dictatorship, the so-called proscriptions had occurred, the names of Sulla's opponents were publicly posted on lists. Anyone was allowed to kill the named men without fear of punishment. In addition, their sons were barred for life from all political office. The proscriptions are said to have claimed several thousand victims. Moreover, Sulla had settled his veterans in the environs of Rome so that he could have quickly mobilized them again if political developments had not been to his satisfaction. However, since Sulla had already died in 78, these measures lost their significance. The Crisis of the Republic After Sulla's death, the big question was whether the reforms he had implemented would last. Even in the year of the former dictator's death, a civil war broke out between the two consuls precisely over this issue. Marcus Aemilius Lepidus wanted to undo the restrictions on the popular tribunate that Sulla had introduced. 
Quintus Lutatius Cotulus wanted to keep them. Lepidus was defeated militarily after a short time thanks to Gnaeus Pompeius. However, Pompey became the personification of derogations, Latin Imperium Extraordinarium, for about thirty years thereafter to deal with acute problems. Such exceptions fueled the political ambitions of individuals and were therefore not exactly conducive to the continued existence of the Republic. Pompey had first drawn attention to himself when he had conquered vast territories for Sulla with a private army. Such undertakings outside of the official career and without a mandate from the Senate actually contradicted Sulla's view of what should be right in the Republic, and thus the thrust of the reforms he later implemented as dictator. However, Pompeius's soldiers and the territorial gains they made naturally suited him. The pattern of acquiescence to law-breaking continued after Sulla's death. Pompey kept demanding new extraordinary powers, and the Senate kept giving in to him. On the one hand, Pompey was objectively a good choice. His military successes in the past recommended him for military successes in the future, and in his commands he proved that he was also a capable administrator. On the other hand, during the decades of the Republic, the Senate seems to have increasingly lost faith that serious problems could be solved by the old-fashioned means on their own. This made the senators susceptible to the demands of self-confident, successful individuals like Pompey, and each time created an example that invited imitation by others. At the same time, the senators were unwilling to adjust the legal framework so that these individuals could have been incorporated into the administration of the Republic rather than making exception after exception for them, which, after all, could only undermine the overall structure. After the victory over Lepidus, Pompey demanded a military command in Spain where supporters of Sulla had established themselves. He sought this command without having been consul, and not only that, at that time he was too young to even be allowed to run for one of the magistrates of the cursus honorum. Nevertheless, the Senate sent him to Spain for lack of serious alternatives, sending the signal already in the year after Sulla's death that the rules laid down by the dictator were by no means immutable. Pompey also proved himself in Spain, and after his return in 71, participated in the suppression of the Spartacus Uprising, a massive slave revolt that had kept the Italian heartland in suspense since 73. Already in 72, the praetor, Marcus Lynchus Crassus, had dealt the insurgents the decisive blow, so that Pompeius's intervention would no longer have been absolutely necessary. The rising, however, provided him with an excuse not to dismiss his soldiers before entering the heartland, as Sulla had actually prescribed. With his soldiers as a threat in the background, Pompey was able to demand more emphatically to be exempted from office and make consul even though he had not yet held a single public office. The senators granted him this exception as well, so that in 70 Pompey held the consulship together with Crassus, with whom he had agreed to cooperate. The two used their tenure to increase their popularity by reversing some of Sulla's reforms, including the restrictions on the popular tribunate. Second, Pompey in particular built for his future by persuading the Senate to give him the command to fight pirates who posed a constant threat in the eastern Mediterranean to the ships carrying much-needed grain to Rome. Pompey eliminated the pirate problem in a few months and then turned against Mithraides VI of Pontius, against whom Marius and Sulla had already fought. Mithraides committed suicide in 63 when he had no hope for a favorable outcome of the war. Now, Pompey could administratively reorganize the entire eastern Mediterranean. He created a territorial and administrative order there on which the provincial administration of the imperial era was later based and which even survived the end of antiquity. So he obviously did a solid job. The only problem was that he made these changes without being authorized to do so by a mandate from the Senate. Accordingly, a certain nervousness spread in Rome when he was to return there in 62, but he dismissed his soldiers in accordance with the rules, presumably on the assumption that his successes in the East would also lend him weight in the capital's political establishment. He soon discovered, however, that he had been mistaken in this. The Eastern provinces were not worth nothing but they counted for relatively little as political capital in Rome. More useful there were still the classic patronage relationships and the powers that resulted from the regular career in office. Pompey, because he had always acted with extraordinary powers, lacked both. He was therefore prepared to make an agreement with Crassus and Gaius, Julius Caesar in 60, which is called the First Triumvirate. 
However, the three were not formally given power, but merely informally agreed not to do anything to mutual detriment and to protect their respective interests to the best of their ability. Caesar had by then accumulated a mountain of debt for his political career that was insane, even by Roman standards, and was now looking for a way to ensure that his debts would firstly not be his undoing, and secondly disappear again in the long term. In 59, Caesar exercised the consulate together with Marcus Calpurnius Biblius, and was thus the only one of the triumvirs to hold a regular office. His tenure was marked by several violations of the law. For example, he undertook an agrarian reform, which in itself was not a bad thing, but we would have belonged to the remit of the tribunes of the people. Above all, he obtained for himself a command in Gaul, initially limited to three years, and later extended to a total of eight years, which he took up at the end of his term. The pretexts for this war and its continuation were often either fabricated or Caesar used even the most trivial incidents to initiate the next phase of his conquests. All this served him to achieve his goals. The war in Gaul was supposed to bring him enough money to pay his debts and enough military prestige to make him forget the breaches of law during his consulate. Last but not least, he created a power base for himself with the newly emerging province of Gaul, which directly bordered the Italic heartland and thus formed a permanent threat backdrop. He succeeded in all this. The Gallic War made Caesar one of the richest men in Rome and a respected general, although Gaul, apart from the mere increase in area, brought no benefit to the Republic. However, he pulled off the conquest at the cost of numerous war crimes and other violations of the law, of which he was as aware as the senators. If Caesar wanted to escape prosecution, and he wanted to do so at all costs, he had no other option than to return to office after his return from Gaul, which brought him immunity and the possibility of creating a permanent loophole for himself. There would have to be a decision on this question that was clear to all concerned, but it was no longer certain that this decision would be in favor of Caesar. For one thing, the triumvirate had developed clear cracks. Cooperation had never worked smoothly because it was purely an alliance of convenience. The tensions had already been so evident by the mid-fifties that Caesar had felt compelled to urge Pompey and Crassus to renew their arrangement. In 53, Crassus was killed in the disastrous Battle of Carrhae. This left only Caesar and Pompey, who were increasingly drifting apart. In 52, the Senate charged Pompey with putting down riots in Rome that had broken out after the People's Tribune, Clodius Pulcher, had been killed in a street fight. He thus gained the recognition he had so long sought. Pompey received his first command in the capital only because several senators had set aside their old reservations about him, and his success subsequently enabled him to become consul again the first in centuries to hold office without a colleague. Now Pompey was less susceptible to Caesar's dodges. On the other hand, the so-called conspiracy of Catalina had occurred in 63. It is not certain that the machinations of Senator Lucius Sergius Catalina were re really as extensive and threatening as Marcus Tullius Cicero, one of the consuls of that year, portrayed them. What is certain, however, is that the Senate rose to the challenge and, for the first time in decades, solved a problem itself and with time-honored means. This new self-confidence was felt by Pompey when he returned to Italy in 62, and ultimately it may have slowed Caesar's rise as well. The Civil War In 49, Caesar's command in Gaul ended. He demanded the consulship for the following year, but this time the Senate did not give in. It sent him a senatum consult ultimatum, ordering him either to dismiss his troops at the border or face military consequences. Caesar ignored the order and crossed with his soldiers the Rubicon River, which formed the border of the heartland. He thus triggered the civil war that lasted until 31 and brought first the end of the Republic and finally the establishment of the Principate. It took Caesar more than three years to prevail. In 48, he defeated Pompey, whom the Senate had sent to stop him, and in 47 to 46, his remaining opponents. Although he had wantonly instigated the civil war, he was able to claim further powers as the victor of the previous battle, so great was the Romans' regard for military prestige. In 45, he was appointed dictator, which made sense, since the Republic was in need of reorganization after years of fighting and crisis. The reforms Caesar carried out were also sensible and nationally justified. The most famous is certainly the calendar reform, which brought the so called Julian calendar which was then valid for over 1,500 years in Europe and is partly used in the Orthodox churches to this day to determine holidays.
However, Caesar had himself made dictator for life, dictator perpetuous, as early as 44, after his dictatorship had initially been limited to 10 years. He had thus achieved a quasi-royal status, and it had become obvious that he would not restore the republic. This was the occasion for his assassination on March 15, 44. It did not change anything at first. Contrary to what the conspirators had hoped, no jubilation broke out over Caesar's death, nor were they allowed to hold the upper hand for long. Gaius Octavius, a great nephew of Caesar, whom the latter had ab- adopted in his son's stead, was obliged by the Roman Code of Conduct to avenge his adoptive father and used this obligation as a launching pad for his own rise to power. He assembled an army of Caesar's veterans with which he marched to Rome without a mandate from the Senate. Their presence was enough leverage to win him the consulship, thus he initially sided with the Senate, which instructed him to take action against Marcus Antonius, an important partisan of Caesar and consul in 45. But no sooner did Octavius have consular powers than he switched sides. He lifted the proscription against Anthony and took over the prosecution of Caesar's murderers. This ensured that no change Caesar had made would be reserved. As a result, the administrators of the western provinces also sided with Octavius. In 43, Octavian, together with Marcus Antonius and Marcus Aemilius Lepidus, one of the western governors, formed the second triumvirate, which, unlike the first, was officially sanctioned by the Senate. Together they continued to take action against Caesar's assassins. In 42, under the leadership of Marcus Antonius, they achieved the decisive victory at Philippi, so that it was now possible to tackle the internal reorganization of the Republic. Marcus Antonius, as the new strongman of the triumvirate, was given the eastern provinces, Octavius the western provinces, and Lepidus the rest. Nevertheless, Octavius was given the Italian heartland with Rome as its capital, the perfect basis for his further rise. The second triumvirate did not last either. After Octavius defeated Sextus Pompeius, a son of Gnaeus Pompeius in 36, there were no common opponents left and his tensions with Marcus Antonius emerged openly. Octavius himself poured oil on the fire here by accusing Marcus Antonius, whose center of power was in Alexandria, of having fallen completely under the influence of the Egyptian queen, Cleopatra. The civil war against Marcus Antonius then also appeared to contemporaries as a war against the external enemy, Cleopatra. Octavius, better known as Octavian, achieved the decisive victory in 31 at the naval battle of Actium. This victory is considered the beginning of the imperial era. The Imperial Period Octavian and the Establishment of the Principate Even though the Battle of Actium marks the beginning of a new major epoch in Roman history, the transition between the Republic and the Imperial Period was not a sharp break, but a fluid one. This can be seen at several points. A change in the form of government came about solely because the small urban Roman elite got into a crisis and did not manage to resolve it. Undoubtedly, there were many problems in the late Republic, including such as the impoverishment of the rural population, which contained some social dynamite. Occasionally, the malcontents also rose up, as did 73 to 71 slaves under Spartacus, his leadership, but none of these grievances brought down the Republic, and the civil war was not accompanied, exasperated, or otherwise affected by insurrections. Thus, for ordinary people, especially outside the capital, nothing changed at first when they no longer lived in a republic, but under a princeps. Society, of course, was not static and evolved like the system of rule, but this happened over much longer periods of time. Caesar's appointment as dictator for life was neither royal rule nor imperial rule, but it was already a monarchy in the sense that the term, from its Greek roots, means nothing other than rule by an individual. Since his supporters gained the upper hand after his assassination, there was also no return from the emergency mode of the Republic to its normal mode. The triumvirate was based on dictatorial powers, albeit divided between three men, and Octavian was later able to build on many developments that Caesar had laid the groundwork for. The picture of a fluid transition also emerges from the other side. In 31, the triumvirate was finally history, and Octavian was the only remaining ruler, but he was not yet the princeps, as the emperors were called until 284. The beginning of his reign is dated only to the year 27, to set Actium as the beginning of the imperial era has less to do with the fact that something fundamental had already changed at that time than with the fact that the one who would be the first princeps a few years later prevailed in the power struggle. 
Octavian, better known by his honorary title Augustus the Exalted. The late Republic and early Imperial period were united by an abhorrence of kingship which remained a fundamental part of the Roman self-image. The story surrounding the expulsion of Tarquinus Superbus in 509 may lack a historical basis, but the oath it contained that there should never again be a king in Rome possessed an extremely real power. Caesar had no qualms about being made autocrat, but he did have qualms about making the resemblance between himself and a king too obvious. Thus he let himself be proclaimed dictator for life, whereby he remained, at least to all appearances, on the ground of republican traditions. It should be noted here, however, that it is, of course, impossible to foresee in which direction he would have rebuilt his position had his unrestricted dictatorship lasted longer than a scant month. Also, Caesar's initial reluctance was probably due less to a personal aversion to an openly declared kingship than to the realization that formerly republican Rome was not yet ready to accept a king over it. This was also entirely true since even dictatorship for life resembled kingship to such an extent for a sufficient number of senators that they assassinated him. Octavian held a similar view here. Unlike his adoptive father, he did create a new form of government, but he took pains to give the appearance that he was merely presiding over an improved version of the Republic and that he himself was nothing more than an ordinary but extremely dutiful old-style officeholder. The point here is not whether he succeeded in deceiving anyone, but that republican values and traditions were still held in such high esteem in the early imperial period that Octavian could not have afforded to cast them aside too brusquely, too obviously. For example, the Senate remained as a central institution even if it increasingly lost its decision-making power. Accordingly, the establishment of the Principate happened in small steps. Even during the Civil War, Octavian derived his legitimacy from his kinship, connected with Caesar first as an avenger, then as heir to the dictator, Divus Lurius, who had been officially defied since 43. Another pillar of his legitimacy was his successes. He attached great importance to making each of them public, for example through triumphal processions, so that a subsequent expansion of his powers appeared justified. Personal prestige and popularity were all the more important to Octavian because the form of government that was then called the Principate was only just emerging and there was not yet an established dynasty. He had little capital other than his own person to fall back on in order to establish his rule permanently, and he knew how to present himself in the most appropriate way. The sunny sides of his person and rule were emphasized, while shortcomings such as his abilities as a troop leader or dark sides such as his violations of the law during the Civil War were discreetly swept under the rug. Such an approach was nothing special in principle, but Octavian had a particularly happy hand for such matters. At the same time, he was not a clumsy manipulator. Under Octavian, no authority existed whose task it would have been to let the princeps appear in the most favorable light possible. He paid no poets for singing praises of him or the like. By the time he came to power in 27, his prestige was already so great that he no longer needed to praise himself. From then on, he left that to others who voluntarily fulfilled this task, be they senators, writers, or other contemporaries. Much popularity brought Octavian the internal peace that existed under his rule. As Pax Augusta, Augustan peace, it formed a central element of his pro propaganda, but it was also an indisputable fact. Political life returned to tranquility under the leadership of the princeps. Internally, the Civil War was over, and no new one broke out for the next decades. Revolts and external wars were also largely absent, because Octavian put the emphasis of his policy on the internal stabilization of the empire. After the previous decades of thousands of victims, destruction and street violence in Rome, this all had a very beneficial effect. Recognition alone, of course, was not enough for Octavian. He also strove to secure his position legally, trying to clothe his existence as an individual ruler in republican traditions. After defeating Marcus Antonius, he succeeded in pacifying the eastern provinces sufficiently by 29 to be able to return to Rome. There he first set in motion measures that seemed like the restoration of the Republic. In 28, he ended all the illegitimate regulations he himself had introduced in the Civil War and the Triumvirate. In 27, in a solemn ceremony, he returned the army, the provinces, and the administration to their traditional holders, the Senate and the people, in the form of the People's Assembly.
but this ceremony also marks the beginning of the Principate because neither the Senate nor the People's Assembly would have been able to perform their duties after the shocks of the Civil War. Octavian, therefore, declared himself ready to assume new special powers. Still, 27, he received the command of a proconsul, imperium proconsulate, for those provinces that had not yet been pacified, which 23 was extended to all provinces. It formed the core of Octavian's power. In addition, there was, among other things, the superintendence over the grain supply of the capital and over road construction. At first, these powers were still limited in time, and Octavian also relinquished some of them. In 19, for example, he finally renounced the consulship and retained consular authority only for the city of Rome. On the whole, however, Octavian thus secured influence over all important areas of the administration until, to put it bluntly, nothing worked without him. Where he could not personally take care of a task, he appointed delegates in his name. The power of the princeps, as well as the principate, as such, thus arose from the fact that Octavian united more and more individual offices and official powers, still stemming from the republican tradition in his person, until he had become indispensable. In this context, it is also revealing that the ruler's title which emerged under Octavian stood for only a few competences. He called himself Caesar in honor of his adoptive father and in order to profit from the association with him, only later did the name become independent of the title of ruler. Augustus was an honorary title given to Octavian by the Senate. It also later became a ruler's title, but originally did not include any power. Imperator was an old republican title of honor for successful commanders, which referred to the military command. It was therefore associated with real power of command. Princeps was a designation that Octavian introduced for himself because he wanted to avoid the salutation dominus, master, which was common in the relationship between a slave and his owner. Approximately, princeps can be translated as first head, thus stands for the attempts to reconcile the republican ideal of equality of all with the fact that one individual always made more decisions. However, the princeps was not powerful because he was the princeps, but because he combined republican offices in his person. In this accumulation, the authority of a tribune of the people, which Octavian had already possessed since his victory over Sextus Pompeius in 36, took on special significance. It made him, like all other tribunes of the people, untouchable. In practice, this meant that no one could oppose his decisions because this function made him untouchable, and conversely he himself could veto any decision of the Senate that he did not like. But the latter was not necessary in practice during his entire reign. Thus Octavian had the greatest conceivable room for maneuver and could actively shape politics according to his ideas, much better than would have been possible without consular power, which he also renounced. The inviolability of a tribune of the people fit well with the increased embedding in the religious sphere that Octavius pursued. He took on more and more priestly functions in addition to that of the Pontifex Maximus, the chief priest which Caesar, for example, had already held, and carefully promoted the beginnings of a cult of his own person. Today, the popes bear this title. It is usually translated as supreme bridge builder, but probably the original meaning was different, which is no longer apparent, or the linguistic image originally stood for something different than we associate with it today. In principle, the principate did not know any personal veneration of a living princeps, since this would not have fit it with the self-image of the office as first among equals. The deceased princeps, however, were defied according to Caesar's model, recognizable by the adjective divas, which was prefixed to their name, and could be worshipped regularly. However, Octavian did not completely prohibit the worship of his person. The extent to which he allowed it depended on where a place of worship was located. The eastern provinces had a tradition of ruler worship that still dated from Hellenistic times, there Octavian could not only allow personal worship of himself, he even had to do it to some extent because the cult was part of the common image of rulers. In the western provinces he allowed the worship of himself together with other deities in their places of worship. In Rome itself, on the other hand, the least was possible because a ruler cult stood in conceivable stark contradiction to the republican traditions. There only Octavian's lairs, a kind of ancestral spirits, were worshipped. The Julio-Claudian Emperors, 14 to 68. Octavian adopted Tiberius, the son of his wife Livia, to designate him as his successor. At that time, there was no dynasty in the true sense of the word, 
so it was not a foregone conclusion that the Senate would accept the proposed new princeps. The fact that the change to Tiberius in 14 AD went smoothly certainly had something to do with respect for the late Octavian, but also with Tiberius himself. By the time he ascended to princeps, he was already over 50 years old and had established himself as a capable military leader. He was extremely popular among the soldiers and in the provinces. With him began the rule of the Julio-Claudian imperial house, whose members came from the urban Roman patrician families of the Julians and Claudians, and were related to Octavian's wife partly by descent and partly by adoption. In terms of his personality, Tiberius, 14 to 37, was not necessarily suited to be princeps. He kept himself rather in the background and had nothing for the propaganda and personal glamour with which Octavian had surrounded himself so skillfully. He did not feel particularly at home in Rome, so that he spent less and less time there and even moved to Capri in the year 26. Nevertheless, Tiberius proved to be an able administrator. He made a point of respecting the legal framework and cooperating more closely with the Senate than Octavian had done. Thus, he played a major role in establishing the Julio-Claudian dynasty. The principate was passed on after him within his family, regardless of the personal abilities and qualities of the respective princeps, just as it is the case in every monarchy. This development took place just in time because Tiberius's relatives showed a significantly lower aptitude for the office of princeps. Caligula's four-year reign, 37 to 41, was a string of embarrassments and excesses that ended with a palace revolt. After this experience, the senators wanted to restore the Republic, but the Praetorian Guard, the imperial bodyguard, prevailed upon Caligula's last living relative, Claudius, to ascend to the princeps. Claudius, 41 to 54, was not personally qualified for the office, but under him at least orderly government was possible. Claudius was followed by his stepson, Nero, 54 to 68, who was much more interested in cultivating his image as an artist and charioteer then in administrating his empire. The acceptance of even unsuitable princeps, however, was not solely Tiberius's merit, but can also be explained by the difference between Rome and the provinces. The personal shortcomings and extravagances of a princeps were noticed only by those who moved within the political and social bitope of the capital. The administration was usually unaffected, so no repercussions were usually felt in the provinces. In fact, the Principate was a success story in the first two centuries. The empire developed sometimes thanks to its princeps and sometimes in spite of them into a prosperous power whose provinces were increasingly better integrated and administered from the center. Romanization, the linguistic and cultural assimilation of the inhabitants, continued. On the whole, there were no internal upheavals and no threatening external wars and the territorial structure remained essentially unchanged. The inhabitants of the empire had reason to be satisfied. Last but not least, the army was the most important source of a princeps legitimacy. In this sense, the Roman Empire had been a military monarchy since Octavius's, even if the activities of a princeps were far from being limited to waging war. As long as active soldiers and veterans alike saw no reason to rise up against the ruler, he was allowed to feel secure. In the long run, the princeps increasingly regarded the army as the part of the population whose interests they had to consider most strongly, because it was there that their own fate was decided. The Flavians, 69-96 to 96. Nero committed suicide in 68 when a military revolt broke out against him. He left no biological or adopted children and had no other relatives who could have succeeded him, so it was completely open who would rise to princeps. Now the importance of the army became apparent. Within a short period of time, different units of the army proclaimed their own emperor, which is why 68 to 69 went down in history as the four emperor's year. In a short civil war, Vespasian prevailed against Galba, Otho, and Vitellius, and was the only princeps from 69 on. With Vespasian began the Flavian dynasty, which for the first time made a loss of importance of Rome conspicuous. The Flavians themselves were not from the capital, and for the first time the majority of the senators also came from the Italic heartland and from families that had only recently risen to the nobility. Vespasian proved to be a capable ruler who brought calm back into the administration after the behaviorally corrupt Nero. Among other things, he inspired the Lex de Imperio, which in the future regulated the transfer of powers and offices to the princeps. He was succeeded by his son, Titus, 79 to 81, who died after only two years of rule. Vespasian's younger son, 
Domitin, 81 to 96, was popular with the army in his own right, but showed a tendency toward autocratic behavior and self aggrandizement that led to his overthrow. The Adoptive Emperors, 96 to 181. After Domitin's fall, the Senate appointed Nerva, 96 to 98, from its own ranks as the new princeps. During his short reign, Nerva carried out several clever administrative reforms that enabled the consolidation of the empire and also addressed social problems. The Praetorian Guard, however, remained hostile to him because the Senate had made him princeps. They forced him to adopt Marcus Ulpius Traianus, commander of the Upper Germanic Army, and thus make him his successor. The pattern of determining the successor by adoption became the norm for the next hundred years or so, so that this period is known as the age of the adoptive emperors. There was no preconceived plan behind this, but rather the biological coincidence that, with the exception of Marcus Aurelius, no adoptive emperor had male descendants. The claim that this procedure served to bring the best in each case to the government was thus a propagandistic exaggeration. This is also reflected in the fact that the princeps did not search for the best candidate without bias, but adopted either a distant relative, for example Trajan Hadrian, or a personal favorite, for example Antonius Pius Marcus Aurelius and Lucius Verus, who however were chosen by his predecessor, Hadrian. Nonetheless, the propaganda proved accurate in that the princeps did indeed consistently choose able men as their successors. The brief century of the adoptive emperors is considered one of the happiest periods in Roman history. The beginning was made by Trajan, 98 to 117. He continued nervous social policy, worked closely with the Senate, and successfully pursued the expansion of the empire. With the establishment of the province of Dacia, the Roman Empire reached its greatest territorial expansion under him but it also became apparent that continuing his policy would have strained resources too much. Trajan placed his behavior as princeps under the guiding principles of moderation and humanity. Together, all this led to the fact that he became very close to an ideal ruler in the perception of contemporaries and was called Optimus Princeps, Best Princeps. Trajan's successors, Hadrian, 117-138, and Antonius Pius, 138-161, each set their own priorities, but continued the moderation within. Their equally positive reputation benefited from the fact that the empire experienced a phase of the greatest possible peace and prosperity. This came to an abrupt end under Marcus Aurelius, 161 to 181. The last adopted emperor was confronted with invasions of the Marcomanni across the Danube limes, which triggered a plague epidemic and with the growing strength of the Persians in the east. The Severans, 193 to 235. Marcus Aurelius made his son Commodus his successor, which turned out to be a bad choice. Under Commodus, 181 to 192, the empire showed signs of decay, and after his assassination in 192, civil war broke out again. In 193, Septimus Severus, commander of the Danubian army, prevailed in the power struggle and rose to the princeps. Severus insisted on his prerogative over the Senate, mercilessly persecuted political opponents, and was primarily concerned with the welfare of the soldiers on whom his legitimacy was based. As the first princeps since Trajan, he again pursued a policy of expansion. The Severan dynasty lasted only a short time. The murder of Severus's son, Caracula, in 212, put a first end to it. Thanks to the efforts of Severus's wife, Julia Mea, her sister, Soamaya, and their daughters, he was able to return to power, but ended for good already after the death of his grandson, Severus Alexander, in 235. The Soldier Emperors, 235 to 284. After Severus Alexander's death, a crisis period began, which is called the Epoch of the Soldier Emperors. It was characterized by the fact that troop commanders were proclaimed princeps by their soldiers. Their imperial power had no other source and scope than their authority in the army. Since they often could only assert themselves in a certain part of the army, the soldier emperors replaced each other in rapid succession, were often confronted with one or even several counter-emperors, and usually met a violent death. Between 193 and 306, there were more rulers than in all other centuries of Roman history combined, and of the 26 more important of the literally innumerable soldier emperors, only one died a natural death. As a result, the central power lost enormous authority, or rather for long stretches of this era, 
there was no such thing as a central power at all. Thus the loss of importance of the capital Rome continued. The period of the soldier emperors was also a phase of competition between the Senate and the army for supremacy in the empire, in which the army stationed in the provinces retained the upper hand. At the same time, the threat from outside remained so that the border regions gained in importance and rose to become the administrative center. All this together caused a whole series of disintegration and crisis phenomena. Individual provinces had to be abandoned, and in some cases special empires arose, as in Gaul and around the city of Palmyra. The economic area crumbled, as did border protection. In addition, there were incessant invasions across the borders by Franks, Alemanni, Goths, and others, several economic crises, and a massive devaluation of money. The population became increasingly impoverished. This was joined in 250 by the first systematic persecution of Christians in the Roman Empire. Although it was the byproduct of an edict rather than the actual intention, Emperor Tyrannius Decisus ordered all inhabitants of the empire to participate in state cults because he blamed a general decline in morals for the empire's problems. The Christians were the only group that unitedly opposed the order and had to bear the consequences. In the 250s and 260s, the nadir of the crisis was reached. From then on, the princeps managed to achieve stabilization again. Galenaeus, 253-268, carried out an army reform, thanks to which Aurelian, 270-275, was able to restore the unity of the empire. Their successors, Probus and Carus, proved to be equally capable rulers. The Tetrarchy After the assassination of Numerian, a son of Carus, Diocletian was proclaimed emperor by his soldiers in 284. He thus began his reign as an ordinary soldier emperor, but he managed to end this phase and create a new form of government. The epoch of the soldier emperors had brought so many upheavals that Diocletian's reign is considered the beginning of late antiquity and also the beginning of a new period of the imperial age, the Dominith. Whereas the princeps had seen themselves as first among equals, personally indistinguishable from their subjects, the Domini from Diocletian onward clearly stood out from them. The term dominant expresses this insofar as dominus was originally the term for a slave owner who possessed comprehensive rights over his slaves. The exaltation of the emperor was not an invention of Diocletian, but it had already become increasingly apparent since the second century. In principle, this development was only logical. The traditional legitimation of the princeps by the Senate, which still stemmed from the Republic, lost importance. Legitimation through dynastic continuity hardly played a role because the establishment of a dynasty rarely succeeded, and legitimation through the army was effective but unstable, as the time of the soldier emperors had shown. The cultic exaltation of the emperor's person offered the most effective way out. Diocletian, however, was the one who simultaneously institutionalized his exaltation and raised it to the next level of development. He introduced a new court ceremonial which his successors also retained. It aimed to remove the emperor from the sphere of the earthly by surrounding him with numerous prohibitions. For example, no one was allowed to speak in his presence without being asked or to approach him without wearing gloves. In the Dominate, it was also normal for a living emperor to be worshipped as a god. His bedroom was considered a sacred space. After his elevation to emperor, Diocletian faced several revolts. To deal with them, he appointed Maximilian as his subordinate co-emperor, Caesar, in 285. With this step, he not only tied a capable soldier to himself, but also a potential rival. After Maximin had proven himself in Gaul, he ascended to equal co-emperor Augustus just one year later. Diocletian, however, felt that even two emperors were not enough to deal with the problems of the empire. In 193, he therefore appointed Galerius his Caesar, while Maximilian chose Constantius as Caesar. This arrangement was given the name Tetrarchy, Greek for rule by four. The Tetrarchy was intended not only to provide much-needed reforms, but also to ensure dynastic continuity after the rapidly changing soldier emperors. Each Augustus adopted his Caesar, who would succeed him as Augustus, and then in turn appoint as Caesar. All four emperors had their own court and had the same powers, but were each responsible for their own part of the empire. The Tetrarchy proved to be successful. The emperor succeeded in holding the Rhine-Danube line and defeating the Persians. Peace also prevailed domestically, allowing them to implement reforms. Diocletian separated the military administration from the civil one by appointing four prefects with extensive powers for the latter. 
He changed the division of provinces and decentralized their administration to make it more effective. His army reform, in turn, aimed at ensuring that soldiers would no longer be able to play the role of emperor-makers in the future. For example, he considerably increased the proportion of auxiliary troops from outside the empire. The Tetrarchy also saw a massive persecution of Christians, 303 to 311. Its cause can be seen in the fact that, from the 3rd century at the latest, the emperors believed that they could establish or at least support the internal cohesion of the empire through uniformity. Unification affected many areas of life, but worship was particularly sensitive because it had always been considered state-supporting in the minds of contemporaries. The proper practice of cults ensured the benevolence of the gods, and they in turn preserved the republic or the imperial state. Since Christians did not participate in these traditional cults, they were considered particularly dangerous. Despite its successes, the Tetrarchy did not last either. The Augusti, abdicated in 305 after Diocletian had survived a serious illness, and Galerius and Constantius took their places as planned. Scontanius died in 306, after which the soldiers proclaimed his son, Constantine Emperor. Constantine's legitimacy was therefore questionable for the other tetrarchs, so that a conflict broke out between them that lasted in various constellations, and with interruptions until 323, when Constantine finally secured sole rule over the empire. He attributed his victory to the work of the Christian god, so that he became the promoter and protector of Christianity, from then on, it developed into an increasingly important social and also political factor. The Late Empire Even after the end of the Tetrarchy, each half of the empire usually had its own emperor. Sole rule developed from the norm to the exception. Theodosius, 378-395, to was the last emperor to succeed in securing rule over the entire empire. He was also the last important emperor of the western half. In 380, he made Christianity the de facto state religion by cutting off state financial contributions to traditional cults. As a result, they sank into insignificance even without a formal ban. In 382, Theodosius concluded a treaty with the Goths in which he granted them the status of confederates. From then on, they were not subject to jurisdiction, but they could dominate the army and, through the army, politics. From the accession to power of Theodosius' sons Arcadius, East, and Honorius, West, in 395, the halves of the empire developed more clearly apart. However, to speak of a formal separation into two empires in this year, as is often read in textbooks, is wrong because it gives too much importance to this date. With the death of Valentinian III in 455, the dynasty of the western half ended. Thus, the empire entered the last phase of its existence. In 476, Odysseus, the Germanic commander of the Praetorian Guard, arbitrarily deposed Emperor Romulus Augustulus. The state is dramatically associated with the fall of the Roman Empire, but from the point of view of contemporaries, it was a conceivably unspectacular event. Odysseus himself thought that he had restored the unity of the empire with his coup because there was once again only one emperor, Zeno, in Constantinople. On the course of events in turn, the disposition of Romulus Augustulus had no effect because the Western Roman emperors had possessed little real significance for quite some time. They had gradually lost the powers that had once established the authority and power of the princeps until they were merely placeholders. Through Diocletian's reforms, the emperor had ceded jurisdiction to the prefects. The rise of Christianity had deprived them of their central function for the cult of the gods or the practice of religion. Finally, since 386, they had to tolerate Germanic army commanders next to them so that they were also without authority in the military sphere. Outlook The deposition of Romulus Augustulus had no effect on the Eastern Roman Empire. It continued to exist, not least because its emperors were better able to maintain their traditional powers. This empire was still in its heyday around the middle of the 5th century and lasted until 1453 when the Ottomans conquered Constantinople. Although the Eastern Roman or Byzantine Empire was predominantly Greek-speaking from the 6th century onward, its inhabitants saw themselves unbrokenly as Romans and their empire as a Roman one. Accordingly, they called the capital Constantinople, which Emperor Constantine had deliberately built as a copy of Rome, the New Rome. The Roman Empire also lived on in the former western half of the empire, only in a different guise, 
The former glory and power of the empire remained attractive, especially to the successors and descendants of the barbarian kings, once allied with Rome. Charlemagne wanted to tap into this prestige when he had himself crowned emperor by the Pope in 800 to the displeasure of the Byzantine Empress Irene, who felt personally belittled by this act. From the 10th century onward, Charles' successors increasingly took up the idea of continuity with the Roman Empire, and from the late Middle Ages onward, the former eastern half of the Frankish Empire was given the name Holy Roman Empire of the German Nation, usually abbreviated HRR. It existed until 1806 when Emperor Francis II laid down the crown to forestall Napoleon, who would have gladly taken it from him. This has been Roman History, compact and easy to understand. Experience ancient Rome from its birth to its fall, including Roman Empire background knowledge. Written by Roman Grapengetter. Narrated by Casey Wayman. Copyright 2023 by Roman Grapengator. Production copyright by Roman Grapengator.